Hi everyone, we've come back from our trip out to Port Davey. We uh, decided to head back because we had a weather window and we'd been rained in a little bit. So we wanted to come back and check back in with everyone. Yeah, we've, um, we came back and the whole pandemic thing's gone a little bit crazier than, like we expected it to go a bit crazy, but it went even crazier than that. So mm -hmm. um, we've decided that we want to be in a, a place where we can reach our relatives. Yeah. You know, like get on the phone. The borders have been shut down, so we can't literally reach them. Yeah. But as you might sympathise, um, you know, we'd like to stay in touch with people that have little babies and our elderly parents and stuff like that. Yeah. So that means uh, these videos are coming to you about a week earlier than what <laughs> they normally would have. Um, a few people asked us to sort of have a word to you about, like, do the right thing during the coronavirus, but I probably won't because one of my pet hates is people with even minor celebrity like us getting on their soapbox and being expert about it. Mm. But we do hope that it's not um, it's not presenting you with any... Major inconvenience. Well, major hardship. Or hardship. The people that you love, I hope they're coming through all right. And yeah. No one's, um, you know, too, too severely affected. We've, we've, got a, we've got an audience that's such that I'm, I'm sure some people are feeling the pinch. It's just the... There's quite a few of you out there. So, look, our, our sympathies go out to anyone that's having a really hard time of it. Um, and we, we, all we can do is just hope that everyone comes through it okay. Yeah, on the on the positive side, we hope that you're enjoying these times, like with your perhaps with your children, spending more time at home with the family, um, and just staying in touch with everyone online because we're so fortunate right now to be have have all that available to us on the internet and to be able to keep in touch with everyone while we're separated. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. Imagine if it was like carrier pigeon or something. <laughs> It'd be rough. Yeah. Um, if it makes you feel any better, Pascal and I are still uh, confined to a space that's about two metres by four <laughs> metres. We're still looking at each other. We are still washing ourselves with a flannel out of a pot that we heat up on the sink. <laughs> We've never had a shower. And we have to be careful now with uh, heating up water because We've just discovered that all of the meth oil is out of stock because people have been making hand sanitizer. So we really have to be careful with our fuel consumption. <laughs> yeah, so if you can still have a hot shower and, and cook a hot meal without worry about fuel, you're, you're at least doing that much better than us. But yeah. may, maybe we've got better access to seafood, I don't know. But anyway, now that we're back, we can upload these videos of the Tasmania series <laughs> for you. So I think without further ado, here's the first episode. Welcome to Free Range Sailing. Join us as we sail around Australia, visiting its wild places in our 30-foot, 50-year-old sailing boat, Marul. Living off the land and sea while sailing a yacht that costs less than a new car, we show that it's possible to have big adventures with a seaworthy boat on a very modest budget. Our time in Eden had left us well rested and ready to tackle Bass Strait and sail for Tasmania. We left in windless conditions but anticipated a change to send us on our way southwards towards the Ferno Group. Well we're off, we turned the engine off finally, we've got a little bit of wind to steer our course. And we're expecting northerlies uh, to take us across the strait, predicted to be 20 to 30 knots. Uh, through the night and then it's going to ease off again so we'll just see how we go but we've got a, about 190 miles to go to get to uh, Anchorage in Flinders Island. So I'm, I'm expecting 15 to 20 knots from the south.
as we're coming up to Green Cap here, there's like no 15 albatross getting around. They're pretty big. There's one sitting in the water up here, actually. Oh, really? Yeah, We'd gotten used to the company of shearwaters, and now they were being joined and dwarfed by their larger cousins, the albatross, a sure sign we were entering higher latitudes. So we're just passing Green Cap now and uh, behind it Disaster Bay so we were able to come off the wind. We were pretty close hauled to try and try and get round it but we can open up our attack a bit now. So we're making about five and a half knots so that puts us there at about 10 o'clock tomorrow night um, but we're expecting if we do get those those Nordleys you know, behind us at around 30 knots we might make up a bit of time. So with visibility the way it is, and it's down a lot, this might be our last look at mainland Australia for a while, because um, it won't be long till we're entering Bass Strait. It's got grey skies, we're rugged up. There's not the big seas and the big winds, but sort of that was by design, you know, we didn't really want to venture in here while it's going too crazy. So we want to try and get our way to uh, the islands of, to the north of Tasmania there in the Ferno Group before the next lot of big winds come through. So many seabirds, huh? As we enter new areas, it often takes us some time to identify the wildlife around us. We think it's a real pleasure of cruising. We saw plenty of these gannets because it's too cold down here for boobies. So we just had the weather report. What do you think about that? North, uh, north, northeastly, 15 to 20 knots through the night. Pretty good. There's a strong wind warning for tomorrow morning, but we might be away from it a bit by then. <laughs> I, rec I reckon we'll, we'll get some of it. Yeah. So that's uh, that's a pretty good a pretty good weather report from um, from our point of view. That's sort of what we want, 15, 20 knots. We are ready for it to go 30 knots, but because it's from the north, um, you know, it, it shouldn't really be really big seas, like two, two and a half metres, something like that. So it's neither here nor there. So we're making good time now. Seven knots. Yeah, we're off to a slow start. We were off to a slow start, but now we're doing six and a half to sevens. I anticipate that we'll probably make pretty good time. As we get further down, the I think the flood tides turn west and the ebb tides go south, but I'll just reconfirm that. So that might throw us out a little bit, but there we go. We like to get our sails reefed ahead of strong winds if we can, and also to do it in daylight if we expect stronger conditions after nightfall. Having moved our reefing hardware to the mast base has made our life much easier when reefing. We removed our lazy jacks some time ago and don't miss them all that much except we do need to tie in our main reefing pennants to keep things tidy. I want you to get up now. I want all of you to get up out of your chairs. Get, 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 get up now, get up now. I want all of you to get up out of your chairs. Get up now, get, 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 get up. Our little yacht seems more like a living thing to us rather than a wind-driven machine. Instead of being in charge of a vehicle, it can feel more like we're engaged in a cooperative effort with Moral. 
We don't have to answer to anyone but each other, the demands of the yacht and the seas that carry us. With the sun setting and the wind continuing to strengthen, we decided to be safe and put in a second reef while we still had daylight. You know you have reefed at the right time when there is barely any change in your speed afterwards. One of the tricks we use comes from our friend Wendy and the short-handed sail racing world. Trailing the main halyard in the water when reefing gives enough resistance to prevent the mainsail from falling uncontrolled and ensures that the halyard suffers no tangles. Well, we've been motoring for a few hours now. Last night it was um, it was pretty hectic. I actually had to hand steer for the most of the night for about three and a half, nearly four hours, because it was it was 30 knots. Um, the, we had a quartering sea, so I would sort of try and throw the stern around. Marul tracks really nicely in a following sea, but the autopilot was just being a little bit overwhelmed because. If we came just a little bit off the wind, then the apparent wind would change. Um, and so she'd really ramp up and take off. So I found that I just had to hand steer just for safety because, you know, like two and a half metre waves, she wasn't broaching, but she was definitely sort of wanting to fly off one way or the other. But hand steering, you know, I could sort of predict it. Um, and it was, it was really easy to track straight. So 
it did, I did have to sit on the tiller, but it wasn't really that difficult. So there's a few hours doing that. There was a highlight though. There was a lot of um, bioluminescence, or some people call it phosphorescence, in the water. So every time we came crashing down off the wave, you know, we were surrounded by like this uh, this fluorescent light green. Very very hard to film, um, you know, the ISO settings on the camera. So you're going to have to go out and see that sort of thing for yourself. Um, but every time we like crashed into another pod of dolphins, you know, I could I could just see these vapor trails just flying all around the boat and as they jumped out of the water they just exploded into green so it's it incredible but we've gone from uh, 30 knots to pretty much hardly any wind every now and then it'll come up you know to about 10 knots and then die away again so we're running the main engine instead of doing uh, seven eight knots um, and getting in tonight you know, we're down to four, so we've halved it, so now we're getting in early tomorrow morning. Uh, spend a bit more time out here with the birds and the dolphins. So I've just turned the engine off and we're sailing again, which is great. After motoring since sunrise, it's, it feels good to be under sail again without that engine clattering away. I think we're going... Yeah, we're going an average of six and a half knots. And what's really cool is that we're about to cross over, we've been in like 3,000 metres of water, but we're about to cross over contour lines. So the, the water's gonna come up shallow. So I've got both the fishing rods out, so hopefully we catch something. When we'll sat and centre, close a distance on us now. Instead of pulling us back down Seems like everything we had before Is leaving us now And I, I wanna be where you are I wanna be where you are Well, just as we hit the shallow contours with all this chaos with birds and everything and we got to see heaps of dolphins. We didn't um, catch a fish because obviously <laughs> we had a dolphin show. <laughs> um, I'm pretty happy with the dolphin show. <laughs> the dolphins like that lure, didn't they? They were rolling all Yeah, they were all around the lure. <laughs> the gannets like it too. They keep flying over the top and looking at it, looking at it, looking at it. <laughs> they don't dive down on it. Another sunset meant it was time to reef the mainsail again. As you can see, the cross swell was working with the wind and giving us a pretty heavy lean on the odd occasion. Timing the rolls is important to working on deck safely, but it does come to be second nature.
We went into the night close on the wind and well reefed. When we reef the head sail, we lose the telltales that show that how the wind is flowing over the sail. However, the main sail has nine telltales, so there's always still some visible even when we're fully reefed. Once we have the main flying well, we can match the shape of the head sail to it. That's a bit of a reverse of how trimming usually works. Out of sight to our east, the Sydney to Hobart yacht race crews were dealing with the same varied conditions. I'm pretty sure they would have welcomed this more consistent wind. What a breakfast! Yeah, we've got corn pancakes, bacon, avocado, a nice cup of tea. It's good to sit down to like a, a nicely prepared meal after a long passage, isn't it, Troy? It is. <laughs> so we didn't go as fast as we expected overall because um, we got the northerlies and we were boosting along and we we managed to get an average of about seven knots because we were we were confronting a sea. Um, but then in the morning we just sort of lost wind yeah. and, and even getting in here we had to tack. So. Yeah, pretty varied passage. Yeah, knocked our passage passage time down. So we got in at three o'clock yesterday morning um, and we came well, in. Well, actually three o'clock this morning. This yeah. morning. <laughs> so I'm still a bit rattled. Um, we're going to have some breakfast, but we are anchored. Where are we anchored? We're at Babel Island. Under Babel Island. In the Ferno Group. That's probably why I'm talking in tongues. Welcome to Tassie. Welcome to Tassie and I can see some Cape Barren geese on the beach. We'll go and have a look at those. Cape Barren geese were facing a grim future not long ago, but measures to preserve them have been put in place and their population is fighting back to healthy numbers. Thanks for tuning in this week. Also, if you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel as it really helps our videos get recommended to a wider audience.